Today we're going to talk about bias. And no, that's not the condition where a person has two butts. Get your mind out of the gutter. We have serious heathenry to do. So in this video, I'm going to kill all your darlings, but stay with me. It's going to be okay. So stop me if you've heard this one. I prefer the poetic Edda over the prose Edda because the prose Edda has Christian bias. Now, this take gives the wrong idea for a couple of reasons, not because the prose Edda is devoid of Christian influence or something. It's rife with it. But let's take a look at the available sources we have. The main sources we have lying around are, as mentioned, Snorri Stolason's prose Edda, uh, as well as his Heimskringla. Snorri was an Icelandic poet, a historian, and a politician. He was also very much a Christian. The second major source that we have is Saxo Grammaticus's History of the Danes. Specifically, books 1 through 9 are relevant to heathenry. And finally, the most popular, and what many heathens will consider the most important, the Poetic Edda, or Codex Regis a book of unknown authorship that was rediscovered in the 17th century, but was written sometime in the 13th century, which would give it a Christian origin. After that, we have a wealth of sagas and skaldic poems, many of which have a traditionally attested authorship of some kind, but some don't even have that. Most were likely Christian monks recording the stories that they knew based on the sources available to them, sometimes offering their thoughts, and then keeping them in monasteries. But before all of that, we have an exception to the rule of Christian sources, which is the Roman historian Tacitus writing about the Germanic tribes, which contains information about what the religion may have looked like centuries before the Viking Age. So let's go through some of these sources. How trustworthy are they? What biases do they have, if any? And what kind of things should we be on the lookout for while reading these sources? So... Let's start with the Prose Edda, which is the one that is the most obviously rooted in Christian bias. And with that, we can talk about the greater issue that usually results from Snorri Stolason. So let's start with a little background about Iceland when these documents were written. Iceland was settled by the Norse in the late 9th century. Icelanders adopted Christianity in the year 1000 at the dawn of the 11th century, which means that heathenry flourished there for about a century before the transition to Christianity began. Snorri is writing in the 13th century, around 200 years into Christianization. Now, the Edda seems to have been written as a handbook to understanding the myths, many of which are now lost. It has summarizations and explanations of myth, as well as explanations of how certain elements of Norse poetry function, such as kennings as references to people and objects. An example of a kenning would be referring to gold as the fire of Eir. This references a legend where Eir hosts the gods, and uses gold to light his hearth. And they can also be descriptive, such as referring to a ship as the horse of a sea king. This leads us to a very obvious example of Christian bias in the Prose Edda. Snorri explains how Christ is referred to in Kennings, and this informs us a little bit about the author's perspective. So in the text it says, How should Christ be referred to? By calling him the creator of heaven earth, angels, and the sun, the ruler of the world, the heavenly kingdom, and the angels, the king of the heavens, the sun, angels, Jerusalem, Jordan and Greece, and the counselor of the apostles and the saints. Early poets associated him with the wellspring of the Norns and with Rome, as for instance in the verse of, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that, they say that he sits on a mount in the south and by the wellspring of the Norns. In this way, the mighty king of Rome has strengthened his realm with the lands of the heathen gods. Another possibly more on the nose Christian reference is that it starts with God creating the heavens and the earth. It then discusses Adam and Eve and then moves on to discuss Noah <laughs> of all people. After that, it discusses Thor as the son of Trojans who seem to have escaped to Thrace. And then it further discusses a number of deities as people instead of gods. And this is a process of recording myth and history together called euhemerism. Snorri discusses Thor as being from Troy, ruling Thrace and getting married to Sif. And thereafter, an expansive genealogy is described for several generations until we get Odin, <laughs> who then travels north and rules Sweden, where he is succeeded by his son Ingvi, implying Ingvi Freyr. 
Now, this might seem a little inconsistent with the Norse mythology that you might be familiar with, but one of the reasons for that is that the prose Edda contradicts all of that later in its telling of myths beyond this opening. The rest of the text pretty much abandons this narrative and tells more familiar stories. Now, why was this even there? Snorri seems to have wanted to bring a connection to the classical sources of Rome, and he chose to do that through Troy. This was his way of legitimizing the source, which he goes on to contradict in the remainder of the text. But it's likely why this passage, which opens the prose Edda, even exists in the first place. Does it delegitimize the rest of the source? No. Now, this bias does not remove the usefulness from the prose Edda, as I've seen some try and propose. The prose Edda contains in it references to myths we're missing, giving perspective on the myths that we have, and sometimes expands information. There are points where it contradicts other sources, mainly the Poetic Edda. And this really isn't a problem so much as it is extra information. We should expect multiple windows into the past to contain multiple narratives. But it's important to keep in mind that while you're reading the Prose Edda, you're reading a commentary and summarization on myth from a Christian writing to preserve his culture and connect it to existing classical sources. As such, you know, in summarization and commentary, he might include some of his own conclusions and opinions. But this is true of most historical sources. The way to look at this is as a window into Snorri's perspective on information that we've otherwise lost. And we can gain more perspective by comparing that with other sources. So, the next author that we have is Saxo, who was a Danish bishop and a historian, writing in the transition of the 12th and 13th century. And he recorded what is essentially a version of the traditional history of Danish culture. There are 16 books, but the ones that are relevant to heathenry are books one through nine. And he seems to have drawn from a number of sources, including oral histories of the Danes and the Icelanders, but also seems to be using histories in order to build his own coherent narrative of everything that he's heard. It should also be noted that Saxo is one of those historians who is happy to let you know exactly what his opinion is throughout the record. <laughs> so we discussed how Snorri employed Euhemerism, the retelling of myth with deities as great heroes or kings. Snorri's employment of this is mainly at the intro of the Prose Edda and the Heimskringla. But Saxo employs Euhemerism as a standard whenever referencing specific deities. So for Saxo, Every being discussed in myth is part of a physical world interacting with Danish history. I have it on good word that Saxo's estate is suing Marvel Studios for copyright violations. So, Saxo's specific approach to euhemerism as a Christian is used to undermine the heathen gods as much as possible. The gods are so central to stories in Norse culture that he can't just discard them. So he takes this approach in order to preserve the tales and make them agree with his conception of reality. He routinely casts Odin as an old wizard that just lives somewhere in Scandinavia, and he even makes fun of the Norse for believing that he's a god. But then he also seems to record in his record that Odin continues to live and interact with people across multiple generations. Saxo justifies his writing of legend this way through describing the silly beliefs of the Norse and their worship of these different species of wizard. Now, he says in chapter 20 of book 1, I intend to touch briefly on their activities, but in case I should seem like a brash inventor of tales which strain men's credulity, it is worth telling you that at one time there were three amazing species of wizard, each practicing their own miraculous illusions. Saxo goes on to describe giants of incredible size, the practitioners of magical arts who did battle with them, and the offspring between them who seem to fool these barbarians into thinking they're gods. He further elaborates on this by saying, It's not surprising that barbarians yielded to their weird hocus-pocus and were led into rites of a debased religion, since even the intelligent Romans were seduced into worshipping similar mortals with divine honors. I mention these matters so that when I write at length of portents and marvels, the incredulous reader may not contest them. After this digression, I shall take up my narrative. See, he even says marvel. After this premise, he later mentions a man called Odin, that crazy old wizard, who was believed throughout Europe, though falsely, 
to be a god. This is something that Saxo continues to hammer home throughout the narrative, that these people who were seen as gods were really just people that seemed to live for generations and that the barbarous fools around them just worship them because of their magical abilities as wizards. Does this mean that we should cast aside Saxo's record? Of course not. Saxo's History of the Danes is one of the few records that we have around the narratives of Norse myth, and from it we gain harrowing stories, such as King Hadding's journey into the underworld and his brief romance with a Jotun. This story, for example, is one of the few glimpses that we get into the Norse afterlife in written record. We also gain from this text an alternate story of Baldr that seems to have originated earlier than Snorri's, and Saxo is a major source for the stories of Ragnar Lothbrok. So again, with Saxo Grammaticus, we have a source that can be a tough read and has overt bias throughout. But for many stories, it's the only source that we have, and it's one of the points of comparison for other works. So the stories of Saxo Grammaticus are an amazing source for heathens to read and become familiar with. But his particular bias and how he resolved writing about these subjects personally is something that needs to be kept in mind while reading this text. So let's talk about the sagas for a little bit. The sagas have their own issue with bias, and this is in large part because of their Christian authorship. We'll take the saga of King Hrolf Kraki as an example, because, well, because it's my favorite. It's also one of the most out there, you might say, and it's a saga that I've referenced a few times on this channel, so most of y'all will be familiar with it. The saga concerns an early Danish king who, through his strong character and good luck, becomes a venerable hero with a retinue of incredible men at his side. Among them is Bodvar Bjarki, the son of a werebear that I mentioned in a past video. This story gives us a little perspective on how Norse cultures saw animism. Freyr worship is depicted, for example, and there's a very strange appearance from Odin that's described. But a number of biases to consider also appear in the story. The princess and later queen, named Fit, is depicted in a number of negative tropes of the Sami people, showing that Christians writing these legends inherited what were likely pre-existing biases against the Sami from the Norse cultures, and then inserted or preserved them into the story. A number of sagas have this issue, and it's something for which to keep an eye out and to understand. The Sami people exist today and have been subject to oppression both religious and secular. Christian missions attempted to eradicate their culture through various abusive and extreme methods of conversion, including the burning of their sacred tools. The existing secular governments placed restrictions on their way of life due to resources being found on their traditional lands. Those familiar with American history might recognize some of the similarities with how America treats First Nations from the nation's founding through today. Further, the Christians recording these stories had noticeable biases against the heathen religion of the past. Odin is referenced as an evil spirit, despite helping the hero in the story. And there are other pagans in the story who are depicted as evil seemingly because of their paganism. Hrolf Kraki, however, is depicted as more or less of an atheist who loses a battle. And at the conclusion of this battle, the scribe narrating the saga proceeds to lecture Hrolf Kraki for not being Christian enough to overcome, and he laments that Hrolf Kraki never knew Christ. This honestly leads me to believe that Hrolf Kraki's casting as an atheist was likely a change inserted by the Christian writer only to make him not pagan so that he could still be celebrated, and yet still not Christian because Christianity had not yet reached these lands. In spite of this bias, it's a story rich with legend and perspective. It includes an account of Odin's character. It depicts the king of Sweden's relationship with Freyr. It includes tales of werebears, elves, and other magical beings. It's a fantastic read. But one should read it with this bias in mind if they expect to learn from it. The sagas, especially ones that fall into the legendary genre like this, should not be seen as reliable historical sources but his faint memories of heathen stories once told around a fire. Let's talk about the Poetic Edda, which is sometimes erroneously called the Elder Edda because it was once thought to be a record of an Icelandic writer composing around 100 years before Snorri. But instead, it's a manuscript that originates from the 13th century that was rediscovered by chance in the 17th century. It contains poetic representations of several legends that we also find in the Prose Edda, as well as some that we don't, giving us 
hints of how many stories might be lost to time. The bias in the poetic Edda is far more subtle and gets missed by people because they don't often think that it's there. This actually makes the bias that it contains more dangerous. People will generally notice overt bias. People don't really notice subtle bias unless they're looking for it. It's important to note, especially in the case of the Poetic Edda, that all of the Norse manuscripts that we have access to were recorded by Christians. We do not have any sources that were crafted by pagans who believed in the heathen gods without going through the hands of some Christians first. The Poetic Edda is a great example of how this problem manifests. An exception to this rule might be things like rune stones or various inscriptions across the heathen world. These would have been sourced by heathens. However, they often do not contain very much detail. They're often short descriptions of events or celebrating people. Perhaps sometimes they mention a deity. Thor, for example, is common. But these detailed manuscripts we have, these are Christian sources. It's true that the Poetic Edda has a number of things on its side. It doesn't employ euhemerism. Uh, the record in verse gives a sense of authenticity. It contains stories that seem to hold the gods in reverence rather than making fun of them. And the writers don't seem to just stop the story and interject their own opinions. However, with the Poetic Edda, we see the effects of these stories evolving as they become removed from the period in which they were told by heathens. Little elements of Christianity start to make their way stealthily into the narrative of these stories. Ragnarok, for example, may or may not be an honest telling of a Norse legend. It's clearly influenced by Christianity, and who knows if earlier legends included the death of the gods and such finality as depicted in, in Ragnarok. Does it even make sense for gods to die? Heathens disagree with one another on even that simple observation. Ragnarok seems influenced by the Bible's apocalyptic book, Revelation. And it's likely an amalgamation of lost myths in which we would see the relationships between the characters fighting each other play out in more complex terms. The Havamal, the words of Odin, is a good example of this process playing out, actually. Odin's sacrifice to obtain the runes contains several little moments that remind us of Christ. Now, does this mean it was corrupted? Probably, actually. <laughs> but... The set pieces in this legend can be found elsewhere in Norse legend. Idrisil, Gongnir, Odin, the, the runes themselves. These are all arranged in a way that suggests that Odin is a cognate of Christ, told in a way that suggests that Odin might have been Christ reaching out to the Norse people. <laughs> now, this legend likely wasn't that way before intermingling with Christianity. This legend's coexistence with Christianity likely influenced the oral tradition as it was passed down. So, this story of Odin sacrificing himself to himself for the runes might have been a little different if captured a few hundred years earlier. And so we see that this is definitely an evolution of an oral tradition that was halted and photographed in time through the process of writing it down. The writers were likely honest in their intention of preserving oral traditions of their culture, but that oral tradition that they captured is one that is separated by over a hundred years from the people that told these stories as heathens. So this text, like others mentioned before, contains significant bias. This, however, does not make it something that we shouldn't read or even hold dear. But in our pursuit for understanding these myths, we should keep in mind that these stories did undergo a gradual evolution, and that what we have is a brief snapshot of these stories that were told. It's not much, but it's what we have, and we should treasure that. The major exception that I talked about earlier with respect to Christian authorship is Tacitus' Germania. Tacitus was not a Christian. In fact, you could say that he did not like it. He wasn't a fan. Tacitus, though, is a central historian referenced on the subject of Roman history. His text, Annals of Rome, is heavily cited when discussing the Roman perspective on their own history. Among his texts is Germania, or Germania which is fairly easy to find, and it's an accessible text. It's like 40 pages or so. The problem with it is that people will sometimes think is that because it's old and doesn't have Christian bias, that it's a better source. And this isn't quite true. 
Firstly, Tacitus may not be a Christian, but he was a Roman. And as a Roman, he did see people outside of the empire, especially those to the north, as barbarians. Roman history is full of those who look down their nose at other civilizations, noting that they had not and would never be able to accomplish what Rome had built. Especially in the time of Tacitus, as Rome was in its golden age, Rome's armies were seen as invincible, its lands unassailable, its expansion inevitable. And as a result, he writes about the Germanic tribes with this attitude of quaintness. <laughs> it seems that the purpose of Germania was to teach the Romans some of the advantages that Germania had in their culture. Uh, there were definitely portions in which he makes moral judgments on the tribes of Germania, positive and negative. He makes the implication that the Romans should or should not behave like them in various parts. At the same time, he also depicts them as like lazy barbarians. He plays into tropes, he introduces antiquated concepts of race and discusses which tribes he thinks are pretty. And he describes things that they do while commenting on how he thinks that it's weird or how easy it is to take advantage of some of their cultural norms. Hot or not, Roman tradition. Tacitus ranks the various tr Germanic tribes more at 11. I completely screwed that joke up, but I'm leaving it in. Julius Caesar's Gallic War. Gallic War? Ga Which one is it? I don't know. I've been finding both. I'm going to say Gallic War because that's, that's where I'm at. Anyway, Julius Caesar's Gallic War, which contains cultural information of the Germanic tribes, is very similar in its observations. He views the Suebi as arrogant barbarians, and he reveals as much in discussing their way of life and dismissing their religion. He describes negotiations with one of their kings as dealing with arrogance. But at the same time, you can see that Caesar respects his adversary. He describes their troop movements as they try and cut them off from supplies. He invades their territory and then describes how the Suebe safely move their armies into a defensible position in the middle of their territory and that the Roman army needs to avoid them. So should these Roman records be discarded? No! They're biased, but they too are windows into the past. But you should understand this bias as you're reading the text. Tacitus's record is a historical document. Same goes for Caesar's record. But this doesn't make them true. It just makes them historical. And there's a difference between those two things. A historical document is a record of a human perspective. They're biased. They can be corrupted. And they're often all we have. From Caesar, we learn the complex tactics of the Suebi, as well as elements of their way of life and how they lived. And from Tacitus, we get to hear how the Romans discussed Germanic culture, what they noticed, what their opinions were. And from that, we can infer a foggy picture of the past that might even have some semblance of accuracy to it. Let me know where you're at on this. The more I've delved into history, the more I've realized that there's no such thing as an unbiased source. Do these points change how you look at these sources? I feel like a lot of new heathens, especially ex-Christians, will try and look at our sources as if they're supposed to be these infallible texts like the Bible, when this is a religion that was completely bereft of any sort of like uniting canonical text. So we should be looking at our sources with a more critical eye than just blindly trusting the words on the page. And with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. Be sure to like, subscribe, and inform the bell that it's biased against other instruments and needs to change its tune. And remember to find a way or make one.